Hello, everybody. Awake after lunch? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so this is Sir Isaac Newton, and uh, he said something that kind of stuck with me, um, and I want to share it with you. Dollar, dollar, bills, y'all. <laughs> he also said cream, cash rules everything around me. But we're all here today because we, we want to make some money, right? We either have a blog that makes us money, or we sell a product, or uh, we, we, we have a website. Um, so yeah, so how, how do we go about that? And I'm not going to talk about the business side of things. I'm going to talk about the performance side of things uh, because we're all spoiled. We live in an age where everything is instant and we get this instant gratification. And if anything takes more than a couple seconds, you know, we lose interest and we move on. Um, so yeah, so there, there are many ways to improve your, your website, make it more profitable. Um, I'm only going to talk about performance today and a specific type of performance. Um, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle. You, you should be design, using designers, uh, customer research, uh, talking to your customers, learning about what they actually need and what they want from you. Um, you should be designing in a way to encourage conversions on your website. Uh, so this is really a, a, a last piece to this puzzle of you have your application, you've done all these things, now how can we make it more uh, efficient and more performant to convert on those, those, those customers? So 53% of mobile users abandon websites uh, that take more than three seconds to load. Uh, who, be honest, who thinks their site might take more than three seconds to load? I know mine does right now. I need to do some, some work. Um, but performance is important to, to us and to our users. So this is, uh, this, this is a business owner. He has a site, and you know, it, it, he thought it was really great, and it's not really converting very well, and uh, he's, he's getting frustrated. So he, he needs some caching. He needs some performance tweaks. Uh, who likes horror movies? Anybody? Okay. Why do you like horror movies? I'm sorry, I was. <laughs> oh, okay. we had a yawner. Who, who likes horror movies? Why do you like horror movies? Suspense. Suspense, right? Stresses you out a little bit. Okay. Well, this study was done, and uh, mobile delays were just as scary as scary movies. Okay. <laughs> so if your site is slow, they might as well go to the movie theater and see, you know, Jason 52, whatever's out at the time. Right? So we don't want this to be going to our website. We don't want customers to think this here. Um, but it, it stresses us out. And, and I, I know from experience, I sit there and I'm oh, I really need to get this done. And it's just taking forever. I'll do it later. And then I forget. And then I'm very forgetful. So that's, that's never good. And if we want to be dramatic, we're, we're doing this if we're a business owner. We're, just, we're burning money. We're throwing it out the window. And we don't want to be doing this. We want to be, we want to be doing this, like this guy. All right, so, so what is caching, and why is it useful, and why should you look into it? Caching is, or a cache is a hardware or software component that stores data so that future requests for that data can be served faster. Um, WordPress sites, they run on PHP. They connect to a database where your data is stored and your, your posts, your content, your settings. Um, and these are slow. This, this, there's a connection there, and you have to make the connection and request the data, query the data. Um, servers can be slow. Hardware can be expensive. Uh, maybe you have an entry-level server, you don't, or you're a nonprofit. You don't really have the money to throw at you know clusters of AWS servers, uh, and that can get expensive. So uh, I'm, I'll throw a couple analogies at you. Uh, your your a cache is like a grocery store, right? So you go to the grocery store. And when you're caching, you're, you're, you're going shopping, you're getting the stuff, and you're bringing it home, and you're keeping it in your, in your cabinets. And it doesn't make sense for you every time you need to eat to go to the grocery store and come home and make your meal and then and, and eat it. Uh, that's just very efficient. It's a waste of time. So caching is kind of like that. And if you think about it in that, in that way, it'll help you see the things that you should be caching and, and the different types. So the types. There's two main types of caching, and those break down into um, a couple categories. So the first one is non-persistent caching. And this one is uh, basically, if I go to the website, and then the next person goes to the website, my experience will not affect theirs. So what I mean by that is non-persistent caching, it might cache for me, but the next request will not have any caching. So it's on a one-off basis. Um, WordPress does this out of the box using the WP object cache. 
Um, and so for an example, if we look at this, this is just a basic function. You don't have to understand code. I'll explain it. Um, we're going to say while, while i is less than 100, we're going to get post 310. Okay? So without any caching at all, this would, this would do 100 database queries because it's going to go and get the post 100 times. But with object caching, what WordPress does is it takes that post, and the first time it gets it, it stores it in the object cache. And then the next time it gets requested, it just has to grab it from the object cache. It doesn't have to go to the database, get it again. Uh, so you would have one query for 100 different, say, operations uh, as, opposed, as opposed to that. So that's a 99% performance increase. That's great. And um, this is all done in memory. So uh, it gets the posts, and it just keeps it in memory, but only for that request. So even if you go to another page, uh, it, it will have to start over again. And that's non-persistent caching. So let's look at, I did a couple of tests before here, before I came in here. Um, so with no caching, I disabled all the internals of the WordPress caching. A home page with 20 posts had 66 queries. When I re-enabled all the WordPress internals for caching, there were 45 queries. And that was a 33% decrease. So right out of the box, WordPress is already saving you time and uh, processing power and helping you keep your, web, your users on your website. So how would you take advantage of this? Um, so this is a simple function. Basically what this is doing is it's getting a thing for us. It's going to check the cache in the group of my plugin things. If there's data, we're going to return it. If there's no data, we're going to go get our data. And this could be a database query or it could be um, you're building or calculating something. It doesn't have to be a request. Uh, and then we're going to set it into the cache for next time and we're going to return the data. So this is really easy. You just need uh, a utility function that will, will handle this for you and you just call it all the time and your, cache will, your, your data will be cached for your plugin, your theme, whatever it may be. <coughs> so the next type is persistent caching. Um, and this has many more types, uh, subtypes that we'll talk about. The first one is transients. Uh, so this is something that's also built into WordPress. Uh, transient you can think of as the weather forecast. You might check the forecast in the morning, but you shouldn't use the same forecast that night. It's going to change. You have to go out and get it again. Uh, so this is most common for uh, maybe going to Twitter and getting your Twitter feed and, and your responses or your likes, uh, going to your YouTube channel and getting your new videos. Uh, these are things that you would, you would request the data from a service, and then you would store it in a cache in a transient. Um, so a simple example of this. Let's say we check our transient, get transient. If there's data, we're going to just return the data. Uh, otherwise, we're going to request the data, and if it's not an error, we're going to store the data. Uh, transients are always have an expiration, so in this case, we're going to store it for two hours, and then we're going to return the data at the end. So again, a very simple function that you can call. You're just wrapping it around some caching and some logic, and it will, it will store that in your database. Um, and like I said, database transients are in the database, so they're independent of uh, an external caching service or any type of hardware or software you might have to set up. So it's really great because you don't have to do anything extra. It's there for you. You can already utilize this, even on a very basic default install of WordPress. It will create two, uh, two entries, one for the timeout, for the, when this should reset, and then the other one for the data. The only thing with transient is that um, you, you want to make sure you're reasonable with your timeouts. So you don't want to hit a service every hour. They might, or even every five minutes. Um, they, they won't like that very much. You'll say, hey, this site is, uh, is, is hammering our servers and making it harder for us to stay in business. Um, and then you also, you, you want to be, you don't want to cache the whole request. You want to always be parsing the data and storing only what you need. Because especially where the transients are in the database by default, you don't want to have like five megabyte entries in your database. Uh, and transients are not auto-loaded, so that when WordPress initiate, initializes, it will pull all the auto-loaded options and store them in memory right out of the, bat, right off the, uh, right out of the gate. Um, but they are not auto-loaded, so they're going to be database calls, each one.
So I know that I talked about WP Object Cache being non-persistent, um, but it's also set up to be persistent. If you do a little bit extra work, uh, maybe you set up memcached, APC, Redis, any of those custom uh, caching types, it's built in a way that you can drop a file into your WP content folder and replace the core, the way that core does it. Um, so instead of storing it in memory, it will store it and write it to this external uh, object caching. So this is an example. This is the memcached plugin. And you can see these functions will not get defined by core if they're defined in this file. Um, and you can do your own writes in here. So um, there's plenty of drop-ins available for the different types of uh, object caching that you might need. So take a look at some of those. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I went in on a test of that same test site on that same page with 20 posts. I enabled memcache. And that was nine queries after that. So the first time it runs, there'll be many queries again, but then they're all written to cache. And then after that, there was only nine queries. And so that's an 80% further increase in performance. So this guy, he's getting on his phone now. He's calling his developer. He's saying, hey, I've heard of this thing. I need to, we need to see what we can do. So how do you take advantage of this? exactly the same way you would the object cache. There's nothing different here from that first example. Because it's a drop-in, because it's, it's pluggable, it's replaceable, um, you don't have to do anything. So if you write plugins or themes, you can take advantage of this. And no matter what the user's setup is or what their caching mechanism is, uh, they'll get a benefit from that. So that's, that's really great. And transients, if you have object caching set up, they will no longer write to the database. So transients instead would get stored in the memory or on the server for object caching. <coughs> page caching. Um, page caching is like cooking the food uh, from the, after you go to the grocery store and having leftovers in the fridge. So page caching, the whole page will render. It will get converted into some type of file, usually an HTML or a text file and then it will get stored in memory or wherever the, the page cache is set up to be. Um, so yeah, you, you go to the fridge, it's already made, you don't have to cook it again, you can just display it to the user. This can be a little problematic though. Um, this is a, a basic example in Nginx of how to set it up. But sometimes you, you can't cache the entire page. And that's where this type of caching will come in handy, is fragment caching. Um, so who has a store here? Anybody? A couple? So if you think of a store, right, um, the, the great things about e-commerce sites are once you're logged in, everything's personal to you. Uh, you have your account, you have your cart, and all those things. So if you were doing page caching, and you went to the site, and then I went to the site, we would see the same thing. And that's not really the, the best experience there. So if we look at this example here, we have our, 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 a, a product we're just seeing in an e-commerce store. These are the things that we would not want to cache. What's in our cart, the My Account link, and probably more. Um, I think that's on this screenshot. But there, there may be others. There might be at the bottom of the page. There might be uh, because you purchased something where they recommend similar products to what you're interested in. Um, this would be partial page caching. You would hole punch those areas of the site in, in certain files. Maybe you include those template files. And then there would be a way to replace that. And that, only that would be rendered for each request. So that way it's unique to the user and they receive the proper experience. There's opcode caching. Um, this one is usually you will see a three times performance increase on this. And it doesn't really require much other than setting it up. This will basically inject itself into the PHP lifecycle. And it will take the result of the compilation of PHP, and it will cache that. So if you could think of, um, let's say if you're setting up your workbench to build a birdhouse. And once you get all your tools laid out and all your, your supplies laid out, it would cache that state. So that right away, you're ready to get building and processing things. Um, this is one that most of you probably have been bitten by, and you don't even know it. Um, Oh, has anybody ever told you to flush your cache, clear your browser cache, right? OK. So browser caching is a way to define a time or a lifespan for a static asset. 
So that could be a CSS file, a JavaScript file, an image, a video file. It would look something like this. So in this example, we are telling images to have an age of, I believe this was uh, two years. And this one here is two months. So your CSS files will only get downloaded every two months. And your images will be there for a really long time, which they never change. So your users, once they get the image, they shouldn't have to go get it again. But this has a few problems because um, if you do change those files, you need to make sure that they get the fresh files. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I have some tips for you here. Um, caching is not your savior. So I talked about before, you have to make sure that your, your, your application is architected in a way that's performant. There are some just basic concepts that you have to make sure that you're following, you're, you're, you're implementing in your work. You can't just come in at the end of the project and add caching and expect everything to be great. If your application is not designed to allow caching, you're going to have issues. You're not going to be able to implement it. So these are all things that you need to put some thought into in the beginning of the project. You should always assume that the cache is broken or that it's empty. Um, at any moment, your, your, um, your object cache server could restart. It could flush itself and, and remove all of its entries. Um, your transients could expire. So you always have to code defensively in a way that if, if the cache is not present, you're going to be able to still display something to the user. You're still going to be able to get the data. You're going to refresh that cache. For this reason, you should always test with and without. Um, WordPress core in Travis, when, when changes are made to WordPress, there's a job that tests with caching, and there's a job that tests without. So it's always there to make sure that both experiences are, um, are maintained. This is, this is one of the harder things to get a hold of, uh, get the hang of. So, a lot of times when people first get into caching, they go, let's cache everything. And they go, let's cache this and cache that. But they don't think about um, the, the usability of that cache. So you shouldn't be caching these big chunks of data or these, uh, these big calculations. What you should be doing is creating reusable chunks. So if we think about this in WordPress, um, there are cache groups for posts, comments, um, meta, things like that, sites if you have multi-site. And what we cache is the post itself, just the post. We don't cache a query, the result of a query that has 10 posts in it. We don't cache uh, a list of users. What we do is we cache each individual thing. And that's important because if I'm on, I'm on, on say I'm on the top part of the page and that post is listed, and then I go to the bottom, and there's a latest posts list. If it's not individually cached, you can't use that cache in both spots. You would have to have two, you would have a list of posts that is cached, and you would have uh, the post itself. So, by caching those those things as small as you can get them, it allows you to reuse that cache in multiple places. You might have a, a page that displays posts, and then you have a, a page that displays images and posts, and and unless you do that, you can't use that cache. Does that make sense? So um, depending on your application and what it is, you want to consider that. It's still OK to cache other things, like lists of posts um, and uh, maybe results of calculations. If you have this really complex calculation that happens to tell you how, uh, how much you need to spend to uh, make that guy happy that was on the phone. That's OK to cache, too. But it, again, always think about that. How can I make this reusable? How can I make this um, not large? And you always want to consider the size as well. Like I, like I mentioned, um, the bigger the things are, the, the more resources they take, the more memory they'll take. And you don't want to exhaust your, your object caching with like a couple pages, a couple sections of your website. <coughs> Uh, always bust or flush the cache. Um, so when I say flush the cache, that's the object, object code aspect of it. 
So when you update a post, you want to make sure that you are hooking into the code and you're appropriately deleting that cache for that object. So in WordPress, you update a post. That cache for that post is, is deleted. Um, you have this custom data type. You update it in your, your panel. You want to make sure that that gets deleted from the cache. Then the next time someone requests it, it will get loaded, it will get cached, it will be fresh. With the, um, the resources that we talked about, instead of getting on tech support and they say, oh, you just have to close your cache, you know, uh, clear your cache. Uh, this is typically how you would enqueue a style sheet or a script. And so you would name it, you would tell WordPress where it is, and you would include a version. So in WordPress, if you don't supply a version, it will just use the version of WordPress that you're using. So in this case, I was using 5.2 Release Candidate 2. Um, and as WordPress updates, that would change. So that way, when the new version of WordPress is released, the users are guaranteed to receive a fresh copy of that CSS or JavaScript file, no matter what happened, what changes are in it, are there no changes. It just says, just grab it again. We're updating. It's, it's fine. One time will be OK. So by changing this value, when you update your plugin or when you update your themes, that will automatically change this URL. And you can ensure that your users or the, the, the sites that use your plugin, all their users will receive fresh versions of those, of those assets. Um, this is a big one because it's just easy. It's, it's the easiest way to do this. But um, not everybody does that. A lot of people will include the, um, the, the, the style sheet, include, include uh, tags in the header of the file. But if you enqueue them, this is very easy to do. And you can replace this with a function or a constant that uh, get my plugin version. And it will just replace that if you update it in one place. So you don't have to go down the file and replace all those versions. So uh, warming or priming your cache, sometimes it makes sense for you to populate the cache for the user. So instead of waiting for the user to come to the site to populate everything, maybe you have a cron job that will hit the site every once in a while, and it will process that, and it will populate those caches. Um, you, this will help prevent something called cache stampeding. So if the cache expires and it's empty, and then all of a sudden, I'm on uh, Ellen, and she mentions my website. And everybody goes to my website at once, and all the caches are empty. They're going to keep getting written. So if, if uh, multiple requests start around the same time, they're all going to try to write to the cache. And so your cache will get stampeded in it. So sometimes, if you're anticipating a, lar a lot amount of, uh, large amount of traffic, um, warming the cache is, is the way to go. That way, that stampede, it, it will happen from you, and only that cron or, or however you're populating it will, will affect that. Ultimately, every, every site is different. Um, you can't expect to install. Uh, there's several plugins in the repository that will help you do these things, even if you don't have uh, access to install something like Memcache. Uh, it will help you with uh, page caching, um, your, your uh, resource caching with your expire headers and things like that. But every site is different, and you have to evaluate what's the most effective for you. Um, this is some additional reading. Uh, these slides are on my website. You can go and check that out. Um, I kept it short for questions. I didn't get too technical, but I do. I do want to get into that if, if people want to talk about that. I'm not sure who's, who's here would consider themselves a developer. OK, so about half. And who's a business owner or a designer? OK. Um, so yeah, so I do want to answer questions. I do want to help you understand this better. So please ask questions. We want to find this guy, and we want to end up like this guy. So thank you. Who has some questions? I know you have questions. Yeah. You mentioned some hardware. As yes. Well. So how much of the ones that you just you just went through was hardware and software? So the question is, uh, I had mentioned hardware, and so which ones are hardware and software? Um, so the ones that are hardware are like memcached. Sometimes you can set up a separate server, and that server, the only purpose that it has is to 
store the, the cache. Um, Opcode cache is, is software. It just runs on the same server. Um, your non-persistent cache, that runs with WordPress automatically. Um, but in uh, Redis, I haven't worked with Redis in a while, but I believe a, you need a Redis server to, uh, to have the, the cache stored on as well. Yeah. Um, but there, there are some services that will help you with that. Um, and they're, if for a develop, they're not too hard to set up. Um, you just have to monitor them and make sure they're, they're tuned to, to your server and your environment. Anybody else? No? Well, for a short yeah. site, uh, how much memory do you think is required to uh, ensure it's uh, really custom and clean, right? If there isn't much going on besides this page with static content, maybe some comments on the post. Do you mean how many, how much memory for, um, so the question was, how much memory uh, is needed for things like this? So do you mean for uh, the server itself or for, the, the object caches that require a, d a different server? Uh, maybe the first one. Okay, so that all depends on the traffic that you get, the, how the server is uh, configured, what software is running on it. Um, if you have, um, you know, some services are more bare bones, they just give you the server and you set everything up on your own. So for that, you might need more memory because you would probably install less as a business owner. Um, but for more managed solutions, they typically have plugins. Um, so like we have a plugin that it automatic, we're working on adding opcode cache. Um, and it's set up where we have different caches running and configured already for you where you don't have to worry about that. It would just, it would just work. But we also don't let you tweak resources. It's like we have tiers of our service. So um, it depends. And you, you might have to try a couple different ones and see what works for you. Hire someone to tune it, or it, it's, it's not an easy answer. That's a whole other talk. <laughs> yes? <coughs> yeah, so the question was, um, the person's experience, they have typically seen that caching plugins slow the site down. Um, this is kind of what I mean by every site is different. Uh, sometimes people set expirations on caches. So you, and any of those caches, especially transients, you can say this is only good for an hour. This is only good for five minutes. Uh, but if you're a blog and you're not getting much traffic, there's really no reason for that to expire so soon. Your posts are probably good for a year, you know, more than that. Um, so. The caching plugins, they might be configured to expire every hour. And so if that, that post only gets visited once an hour, once a day, every single time that the person goes to it, you're, you're not getting the benefit of the caching because it's always fresh. It's always expired. Um, so that, that's one of the things I mean by um, every site is different. You have to evaluate those things, the different factors around your, your users and their, their habits. And that will, that will really affect how you tune your, your website's caching. Um, the, the, the plugins are good. The caching plugins are all good. It's just they try to do a lot for a lot of different sites. Um, and it's very hard to do that well for all, all the different variables. Uh, WordPress is great. You can run as many plugins and themes combinations as you want. But WordPress is not great because you can run as many plugin and theme combinations as you want, right? So it makes it really difficult to build for it if you're not in there and building it based on what you know is required for your environment. Um, so yeah, so in some cases that, that will happen. Uh, but you might have to turn some things off or start to read into the different things and different settings that it has and, and figure out how to tweak that to work the best for you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Yep. So um, the the I'm sorry. Oh yes, the question. Uh, the question was: Do browsers cache differently? Uh, Chrome appears to be very aggressive lately with how they cache things. Um, as far as I know, if you don't define the caching rules, the browser is going to make the best decision for the user, and that might be based on their settings or what the browser thinks. 
So maybe you're not setting your, uh, your, your cache headers for your JavaScript and, and you're updating and it's not changing. Um, so that could be part of it. But if you want to control that, just define those and the browser should respect those headers. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes? Okay. And in regards to refreshes and even um, R refreshes where I will make a change to the website and then it will show up on every other browser, but then on Safari, it seems to take its time. Is there a way to resolve that? Yeah, so the question is um, the, the person's having issues with Safari. They'll make a change and every, uh, every other browser will see the change, but not Safari. Um, so one thing you could do is to change the version. Sometimes when I develop, um, let's see, so there's a few things you could do. Um, you could just change this, and that should, basically what that does is it, your browser will see this as a complete URL. It includes this in the URL in the location of the file. But if this changes, even though it's after the question mark, it will see it as a unique file. And so that's why that helps with that. Um, the other thing you can do is when you open debug tools, um, a lot of times there's a checkbox that says disable cache. If you check that, it will always get fresh files. Um, so I know in Firefox I have that, and if I uncheck that, and then I refresh the page, it will, they'll actually be grayed out in the network tab because it will say cached. So it already has it, it's not gonna go get it. But it will, it will actually tell you that. Um, I haven't used debug, bar, uh, debug tools in Safari recently, but I'm pretty sure they have something similar. You have to go into web development tools and empty cache there, and then a lot of times that'll re actually work. Yeah, so the comment was um, Safari is pretty bad with that, and the de developer tools, you have to really open it up and, and explicitly flush it to, for it to work. Yes? You know, also is um, Cloudflare, as far as the CDN mm -hmm. is concerned. Sometimes you can go in and, and uh, flush whatever you need to flush within the control panel. Mm -hmm. but, um, if you've got uh, Cloudflare or something similar, Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. So the comment was, um, if you have something like Cloudflare, a CDN, a lot of times you can log in and flush the entire cache or a specific file in there. Um, so a CDN is basically uh, a distributed network of computers that will hold copies of your files, usually your images and your scripts like that. And uh, when the user requests your website, it will serve from the closest computer. So it's helping speed that up by eliminating the connections that the file has to travel through to get to the user. Um, and a lot of times they have those cache headers configured on all the requests to those files because the DNS is going through it and, and requests through their server. So they're able to uh, have a much more fine-grained control over that. Um, so if you really, really need that or you, uh, that's an, an, and I should have mentioned that, it's, a, it's kind of caching but it's more just offloading of performance, um, where they're, they're handling those requests for you, so those requests aren't even going, and then that's gonna, that's gonna help. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes, so there, um, that's one way to configure your cache headers, um, is with HD access. Uh, you can do it with Nginx, um, but if you wanted to have a handle on it on your server, this is what you would do here. That's right, you have to throw your computer off the desk. Yeah, so the, the comment was um, shared hosting uh, sometimes has uh, issues with um, connections and with allowing you to tweak some of these things. Um, and that's true. Oftentimes there's, uh, with shared hosting, the companies will try to make the best decisions for their users because usually they're a little bit more non-technical. Um, 
but sometimes that makes it harder to override certain things and, and configure things like cache headers um, like this here. So they might have a different loading order of certain things. Um, so it always, it's, you gotta find what works for you, what level of configuration you need. Um, maybe it's cloud hosting, maybe it's a CDN to offload all that stuff. Um, you just, again, every site is different. Yeah. yeah. Like this guy. Yes? Is first time to buy has anything to do with caching? Good question. So first time to bite, does it have anything to do with caching? Um, first time to bite, it, yes, everything can be cached. You know, there's always ways to cache it. That would be more on the DNS level, though. Um, so that's basically the DNS server is responding really quickly. Um, you can't really do anything about that other than finding a good name, name server host. Um, C, uh, Cloudflare might help with that because they're a CDN and they, uh, they handle that stuff as well. Uh, but as far as caching on the WordPress level or the server application level, not, not really. That comes first, that's before that. So first step is to publish your DNS? Yep, your, your DNS will be uh, the most important for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, again, it's like CDN. It has network of computers around the world, and the closest computer will respond to your user. Um, it's kind of the same thing. If they have the distributed DNS, it's all over the place. There's a closer computer to respond. It might do better. Um, also, a lot of internet service providers will have their own DNS records, and they intercept that first, and they're the ones that serve it. So uh, they, they know how to... Um, things like Cloudflare and stuff like that, they're on top of that. They know how to encourage the best response time possible. Yes. Yes. So I'm an estranged person. I'm plugin development. Okay. And we encounter a lot of issues with caching being overly aggressive, specifically page caching. So we're localizing scripts that we need, and we find that the cache <coughs> is overriding new things which are already set on transients that we are creating. Yes. So how do we better educate our users when cache has so many like good associated buzzwords out there with it about when and when not to cache it? Yes. So good question. So uh, he's a plugin developer, and he runs into issues a lot where um, they localize data. So if you have a script, um, like we were registering in our example, uh, you can localize information that gets attached to that script. And basically, it will get printed out in the file, in, in the, the page markup, um, or in a script tag. And so then your JavaScript will be able to ingest that as information. Um, so in Gutenberg, that, uh, they have JavaScript localization. So it will localize all the scripts. And then if you're speaking a different language, it has all the translations available. Uh, but his users often use page caching. So that data that gets localized is the same for everyone. Um, so as far as how to better educate them, um, there's things you could do. You could localize your data with an AJAX request. You could, uh, when the page loads, it could request that data. That's one way to keep it fresh. Um, you could uh, t use some of the more popular caching plugins, and you could figure out how to hole punch and, and, and allow that to be uh, unique and generated unique to each request. Um, it's, it's a hard problem, <laughs> but um, those are a few things that come to mind that you could maybe look at. Um, but ultimately, there's always going to be people just installing a plugin and hoping it works. And, and if you can take the top three or four caching plugins, um, that might be a good start to try that out, see how it works. But it might not work for you. You have to kind of see. Like every site is different, every plugin is different too. Yes? High volume based on traffic or on content? Uh, all of the okay. <laughs> uh, he produces content for CBS and the Super Bowl. Okay. So about the Monday before the Super Bowl, I start to see spikes in already high traffic. And by the afternoon of the Super Bowl, it's just sitting there. And for many, many years, I've not used caching, but I've used a round robin on the front end that actually goes to separate physical machines. Mm -hmm.
found that that worked really well to handle the traffic. I basically basically base it on the you know, milliseconds of time when the initial comes in and it says, okay, what millisecond is it in? I go to this machine, you know, so I spread it out all over the machine. Mm -hmm. You're doing load balancing. Yeah, I'm doing this load yep. balancing. Yeah, good question. Um, so the, the person at the talk, he, uh, he has a client that got mentioned at the Super Bowl, and to deal with all the traffic that they received, he was load balancing. He had many servers, and he was deciding which one to send based on which one was available. Um, and they want to know if caching would, um, would help with that. Um, normal, usually, caching can help eliminate servers um, because it's not connecting, it's not getting data, it's doing less work. Each server would be doing less work. Um, you might need uh, multiple caching servers and cluster the servers almost in the same way as you do for uh, the servers themselves. Um, you, you can throw hardware at something all day long and it would get better, uh, but you might have a larger effect if you use caching, things like caching. Um, a lot of businesses, they get a lot of traffic, they might have one web server and it's because they just use caching effectively. Um, so with something like that, you're going to have to do a lot of experimentation. Um, but like opcode caching, uh, where you know, the PHP is stored in a compiled state and memory uh, op, uh, memcached, you have that and all the posts are cached. And you know, maybe you clear the cache every five minutes and you're getting a million people on the site every day. Then you know, a lot of sites are going to, uh, a lot of loads are going to get served from that cache. Yeah, so I think that's a, a great use case for some caching, um, and you'll probably save some money with hardware in the end. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. Um, sometimes when we're inheriting client sites, you know, they've installed all sorts of plugins, and all, you know, and we always want to onboard and kind of optimize it and make sure we most know what's going on at least. Um, but when it comes to transients, like I always hear mixed messages on non-expired transients. We should wipe them. And obviously, like, if supposedly that's what you should do, but then sometimes people say, well, you can't safely do it because you don't know all the plugins that were used on the site necessarily. So do you have any recommendations around how to handle that? Because we obviously don't want to leave transients in there if the plugins don't even exist anymore. Yeah, so the question is, should you remove uh, require, uh, expired transients from the database? Um, non-expired. Non-expired, yes. So... Um, non-expired, I, I recommend no. Um, it's possible they're not expired and the plugin that uses it is deactivated. Um, ideally, you would delete them all and then they would just get regenerated on the next time they're, they're needed. Um, but you can't always guarantee that the, the plugin developer has pl uh, done it correctly. Like they might be using a cron to uh, populate those transients. And if you delete the transient and then it doesn't, if it doesn't get returned and it doesn't go get the data, there would be a gap and you wouldn't have data at that point. Um, so I, I think that the more reliable ones, WordPress core, you can delete the transients from WordPress core, they get repopulated the next admin request or the next page load. Um, carefully, yes. Um, I would be more, more likely to say only the expired ones because those, even if you say get transient and it exists, if it's expired, you get false back, you don't, you don't get any data. Um, so that becomes beneficial when you have a lot of plugins that had transients that were deleted or removed and they don't get used anymore. Um, so you could say, okay, I, uh, I don't use the Yoast SEO plugin anymore. Let me just delete all their transients, you know, something like that. Typically they're really small and the, the, the performance gain is really minimal. Uh, but every once in a while you'll have somebody going out and saying, give me the last thousand posts on this website and cache the entire request and you know, we'll process that when we when we pull the transient. That might be a little bit problematic. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. Two more questions. Anybody else? I think we got them all. Thank you. Thank you.